if you want to take it away, go right ahead, sir. Thanks, Allison, and uh, welcome to our November webinar, talking September production today. And uh, it should be noted, we're down a little more than 10,000 barrels a day. That is uh, pretty much on track with what our trend was, uh, dropping below a million barrels a day before the end of the year, trending towards 900,000 barrels a day by mid next year. Uh, <clears throat> you probably note we have 71 wells completed, I think in September. Uh, that's not enough to maintain production. And so uh, we saw a small drop in production, nothing like we saw uh, from July to August. So production, uh, oil production down about 1%. Natural gas was a little bit more of a surprise, uh, down 2.3%, almost double what oil production drop was. And so I went back and took a look at the numbers, and it's reflective of the shift from McKinsey County uh, rig work and completion work shifting into Dunn County and Williams County, where the gas oil ratios are lower. So uh, the uh, infrastructure in McKinsey County pretty full up with the new plant coming online uh, at Bear Creek. A lot of shift uh, companies' interest into northwestern Dunn County. The initial production rates are higher there. Uh, the gas oil ratios are lower, so they get more oil production, less gas. And also, when you look uh, at one of the chapters, you see that natural gas prices are way down again. We've had an extraordinarily warm fall, and uh, natural gas prices are low. So natural gas and its products are not justifying the economics of producing from the higher GOR areas. Um, just a lot of things happening in the, in the next month or so. Uh, OPEC is going to meet within the next two weeks and uh, talk about what their plans are. North Dakota Industrial Commission composition changes uh, in the middle of December with a new chairman uh, and a new governor coming in. We have a new legislature, uh, which will have a somewhat different look and uh, than, than the last legislature that we had, and certainly a completely different budget situation going into this next biennium. And then we had the national election. And so uh, I've labeled this month's webinar, Something's Gotta Give. And, uh, and there are lots of changes in the wind. Um, so jumping to the OPEC thing, uh, OPEC is planning to meet uh, within the next two weeks. They're talking about production cuts and uh, the news today was that uh, that's looking more probable, uh, but that's coming on the heels of record production. So it's kind of funny that in the anticipation of cutting production, they ramped up production to record levels of 33.7 million a day. So what does that mean about the cuts? It, it means that you end up in about the same place and, and nothing really changes from what it was in August or September. And so we've got to learn to live with this kind of world production. And uh, OPEC came out last week and said they have tempered or reduced their expectation for oil prices over the next few years. They're saying, yeah, we're going to be at $50 a barrel by the end of this year, but they really only expect it to go up $5 a barrel for the next three years after that. So that means that we don't really see uh, oil price levels that would justify much drilling until the end of uh, 2018, and uh, certainly not until in, into 2019. And that, that slows uh, all of the expectations about increased activity. Um, I want to talk a little bit about operators' plans. Uh, operators have indicated that they plan to add about a dozen rigs to the North Dakota oil patch uh, over the next 12 months. So we're sitting at 38 today. Uh, that puts us at that 50 number, and that's what we're using in the uh, budget estimates and the revenue projections. So uh, they've affirmed that that is, in fact, their plans for 2017. Their plans for 2018, they're not talking about much right now. Uh, if prices continue to recover, uh, it'll increase from there. But as to how much, we don't know. One of the things uh, that I want to note is uh, an article came out last week talking about the number of uncompleted wells. We've got just uh, slightly less than 900 in North Dakota. There are over, over 5,000 non-completed wells nationwide in the United States, uh, the bulk of those being in the Permian uh, Basin. And uh, so that's going to mean that 
I'm going to have to have a conversation with the new industrial commission about do they want to extend non-completed waiver status? Do they want to extend inactive waiver status as oil prices stay lower? It also indicates that even if OPEC cuts production, there is a lot of opportunity for increased U.S. production uh, relatively quickly. With 5,000 wells already drilled and waiting to be completed, it's possible for the U.S. industry to fill any void uh, rather quickly. And so one would not expect uh, rapid increases in oil prices. OPEC's probably on track with their five-on-five five for, uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, crude oil takeaway capacity, Justin will be talking about, but obviously uh, with the changes on the national scene, uh, Dakota Access and Keystone XL are, are going to be topics for the next few months, and uh, we'll certainly have to watch and see what happens there. On the flaring side, uh, the amount of gas flared was down, uh, about 2.9 million a day, uh, but the percentage ticked up just a tiny bit. Uh, we're coming in, though, uh, well under the... Uh, the Industrial Commission restrictions. So uh, capture target is 85% and uh, industry's captured 88% and, and pretty solid there. So unless there was a, uh, a rapid growth in production or some kind of a, a major problem with infrastructure, uh, we should be fine running through the winter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about federal rules. BLM has uh, just dropped four new final rules uh, in place in the last two weeks, and that would appear to be in order to beat the deadline of the 60 days. So uh, if a new federal rule comes out within 60 days of a new administration taking over, it can be canceled with the stroke of a pen by the new administration. So we're seeing a, a rush to get new federal rules out ahead of that deadline. If my calculations are correct, that deadline's five days away. And so uh, any new rules that come out uh, more than five days from now can be canceled with the stroke of a pen. And, and I may be a little bit off on that. Uh, we are currently involved in active litigation on four of the federal rules that have come out in the last year or two. Uh, we're looking at six more. Uh, and so we may be adding to that and uh, in the meantime, EPA is uh, going to release their uh, hydraulic fracturing impacts on drinking water assessment. That's been six years in the making, and uh, that'll be coming out early next month. Uh, that may result in some new rulemaking that the, the commission and the state of North Dakota would be interested in. Uh, they've got the information collection request, and of course, we're very interested in class six primacy for CO2 sequestration or CO2 storage. And we're hoping uh, to get that primacy approved by the end of this administration. So there's a lot, a tremendous amount happening on the federal level. The last thing I want to talk about directly, and then we'll take questions, is uh, we published the new break-evens for the third quarter. I think with the exception of Williams County, which went up a dollar, uh, the rest of the counties all dropped somewhere between five and thirteen dollars a barrel. So what we're seeing is industry efforts to increase efficiency and, and really move to lower and lower break-even prices uh, are having a, a serious effect. And so when we get into the, uh, the third quarter of this year, we see break-even prices well under $30 a barrel, meaning that uh, almost all of the counties in North Dakota now uh, are better than break-even for drilling activity. That's why industry is looking at adding a dozen rigs over the next year and adding to rig count after that if price continues to increase. Uh, so great news on the break-evens. I think the unfortunate thing is that um, those break-evens are now competing not just with the Eagle Ford, but they're also competing with Scoop and Stack in Oklahoma and the Permian Basin, which appears like it always has since the 1930s to be the best place to produce oil uh, in the United States. And so uh, we're going to continue to compete with the Permian uh, seriously for, for capital investment and, and infrastructure investment. But that will take questions. Kate, there was one uh, clarification. I think I heard you say 
slow increase in drilling in 2018, but the person on the line thought you said no increase in drilling, so it wasn't really square enough with yes. what you said. So No, I think slow yeah. uh, is the right word, S-L-O-W. Um, we're, we're pretty solid with a dozen rigs being added to the patch uh, in North Dakota in 2017, and we really don't know what 2018 holds, but if OPEC's projection is accurate and the price only goes up $5, uh, it won't be a lot of rigs added in, 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 in 2018. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, first question about break-even prices. Um, what's up with Dunn County? How come they are so low? Well, uh, Dunn County in the northwestern part of the county has uh, really risen rapidly to the top. And what was holding back well completions in, in that part of the world for so long was no natural gas gathering and processing infrastructure. Uh, once Bear Creek went into place and the compression was there, we saw XDO and Tonko Phillips go out and test some of the new high volume slip water hydraulic fracturing with 40 and 50 stages. And uh, the re results are fantastic. Uh, the wells are coming in two to 300 barrels a day better than McKenzie County wells and they have a lower gas oil ratio. So uh, the the Dunn County economics just uh, really got a shot in the arm once Bear Creek came on and companies were able to go in and, and test some of the new frac technology there. They, they've been held back from that uh, by you know, gas processing infrastructure. Okay, so I'm getting a lot of similar questions and um, I'm just going to try to wrap it all into one. Um, what do you think the new Trump administration will do to price and production for North Dakota? Wow. Um, I think production-wise, uh, the Trump administration uh, at least talks about making it easier to drill and move and, and frack oil. And that's not going to result in rapid price increases by any means. So I think, uh, you know, that's part of what I factored into uh, my agreement with OPEC that we're looking on five, looking at more at 515 rather than a, a rapid production increase. The, the price estimates that I've seen that show us uh, getting well above $60 a barrel in 2017, all are based on U.S. production dropping by a million and a half barrels a day. Well, with 5,000 uncompleted wells in the inventory, and uh, this administration Thing. They're going to make it easier to drill and frack and produce. Um, we're not likely to see a million and a half barrel a day drop in U.S. production. That means oil price rise is slower. With the infrastructure discussions, uh, particularly the, the two pipeline projects, I think that's going to help in that uh, operators are going to have the confidence that their transportation costs out of North Dakota are going to get locked in at that six to ten dollar a barrel range instead of wondering whether it might be three dollars or it might be twenty five dollars. So it will reduce the uncertainty a great deal, and that's probably going to be the biggest impact: is uh, a lot less uncertainty in terms of new regulations, in terms of transportation costs, uh, in terms of uh, slowing down hydraulic fracturing or, or any of those things. But on the price side. I think it tends to keep prices lower longer. Any questions from the... I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so Dunn County is at 15. Is that among the most efficient places to drill in the world? It absolutely is, Ben. That, that's a great question. The question was Dunn County at $15 a barrel for break even. It, is that one of the most efficient places <coughs> in the world to drill? And uh, the answer is a resounding yes. That, uh, that number is competitive with the Middle East in terms of bringing on uh, new oil reserves. Uh, new oil reserves over there come in in the mid-teens. And so uh, when, when you're looking at break-even values below $20 a barrel, uh, it's as good a place to drill as any place in the world. Okay, um, how will the new BLM methane rule affect North Dakota? Well, we're, uh, we're just now looking at the new BLM uh, venting and flaring rule. And I, I think uh, sometime in the next day or so, I could have a conversation with Neil Cornsey at, at the BLM. 
let me say that my preliminary review is uh, is very promising. Uh, they made drastic changes to the rule to make it much more compatible with North Dakota's gas capture rules. Um, there are still some concerns about it that I need to talk with uh, legal counsel about. Uh, for example, they still want to apply the rule, it appears, to private and state tracks within an approved uh, communitized area. And I need to have some discussions with legal counsel about what that really means. Uh, that would be really our big concern, is if you begin to apply federal rules to private and state mineral owners just because they fall within the same spacing unit. So we're taking a look at that. Uh, but uh, BLM shifted from a prescriptive volume number to percentage gas capture numbers, like North Dakota uses. Uh, they shifted the, the time frames and really made the, the rule far more compatible with the way North Dakota regulates flaring uh, than the initial proposal that came out. It's a very, very different rule. And, uh, but I need a couple of days to really digest it. Um, any way to measure the overall impact the Obama administration's rules have had on production uh, since most of them are not in effect? Um, I, I don't think there's a real way to measure it. I think uh, um, when we litigated a lot of those rules, uh, we put those numbers out there, and I'd have to go back and, and tally what those numbers would have been if we were uh, had been unsuccessful in litigating the rules and getting injunctions and stays. But the truth of the matter is that uh, the states worked together to block, uh, at least temporarily, almost all of those rules. And it will be interesting to see what happens now with the new administration coming in and where that litigation actually leads us. Uh, but when you look at clean power, you look at waters of the US, you look at BLM hydraulic fracturing, uh, all of those were stayed or enjoined. And uh, so they didn't have any impact, uh, no measurable impact on US production or North Dakota production. Okay, we'll stay with impact on production. I'm getting kind of the same question here from multiple people. Is the delay with Dakota Access impacting production? Well, I, I think it is. Uh, and I think that the reason that it is, is again, that uncertainty thing. Um, when North Dakota producers look at their economics. Uh, they have to look at well costs, uh, well productivity. They look at our tax scenario, and our taxes are higher in North Dakota than in uh, the places that we're competing with, uh, nominally Oklahoma and Texas. And then they have to look at transportation costs, and that is a big factor in North Dakota. Uh, if they can lock in a known transportation cost of six to ten dollars a barrel, uh, that really helps them in terms of uh, raising venture capital or, or borrowing money. But if they're potentially looking at uh, higher numbers, let's say they ramped up production and all of that ended up having to go on rail cars uh, and, and cost 15, 20, $25 a barrel for transportation, uh, then it puts North Dakota at a big disadvantage. And so I think that uncertainty uh, without the pipeline and having to look at any increased production might end up in a rail car uh, at much higher transportation costs has uh, decreased activity and production. Um, question, just point on a uh, clarification point on transportation costs: six dollars a barrel without DAPL versus three dollars with DAPL. No, I think uh, it's more six to ten dollars with DAPL, uh, potentially twelve to twenty-five without DAPL, uh, if it's necessary to to rail the oil to the east coast. Uh, or to the Gulf Coast in, in order to uh, export it. But, uh, Justin follows that a lot more closely than I do, but I think what we're really looking at, the impact of something like Apple, is locking that down long term and uh, giving a, a known value to the transportation costs as opposed to uh, transportation costs that can be all over the map and, and change very, very quickly. With the Dakota Access Pipeline, can you actually measure that uncertainty in terms of how much uh, decreased production has been? Uh, great question. Can we measure the effect of the uncertainty on decreased production? And uh, I, I think the, the measurement, I don't think I could put a number to that, that it has actually decreased uh, production. 
Um, I think the uncertainty is that we don't know uh, enough about the wellhead price in the absence of Dakota Access to ramp up production and to, to begin completing the, the 900 duck wells or, or non-completed wells. And so I think uh, it's a major factor in, in why industry is just maintaining that, that duck population. But I don't think you could point to it and say it's actually led to a decrease in production at this point in time. I think it's going to, unless we get it approved, it's going to slow any production increases uh, in the future. But I don't think it's led to any decrease in production at this point. Do you think um, your uh, thoughts on production growing as far as a million barrels a day has changed? Um, has that been pushed back to 2018 instead of 2017? Um, and, and I'm not 100% following. You're talking about actually getting back, back to above, a million barrels yeah. a day? Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I actually didn't recall ever projecting that we were going to get back above a million a day in 2017, but uh, perhaps I did towards the very end of 2017. In any case, um, yes, I think the lower for longer oil price pushes that million barrel a day number out into 2018. Okay. Anybody? If uh, the code access is finished and if uh, we still were back on the table and completed, uh, would that largely be solved, you know, the issue of uh, Uncertainty and the 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 future So the, the question was, would Dakota Access and Keystone, that combination, uh, pretty much eliminate the uncertainty in, in terms of uh, oil transportation prices? And I think the answer would be yes. That, that combination of capacity on those two pipelines, and particularly with the potential expansion uh, capacity on Dakota Access, it, it pretty much uh, absorbs all of the production increase that doesn't want to be on rail. Anyway, there's always going to be, I, I think, some rail transportation uh, to move to some markets that are, are just not accessible by pipeline. But those two in combination pretty much absorb uh, all the production increase that doesn't want to get on a rail car and go to the West Coast or, or to the far Northeast. Um, possibly a bit unrelated, but um, with uh, the incoming administration, um, uh, gubernatorial, um, do you have any idea perhaps uh, when you might be meeting with the transition team uh, kind of to go over, uh, go over the operations of your agency and um, are you going to be willing to uh, continue in the new administration? <laughs> Couple of good questions. Oh, yeah. So the, 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 the first question was, um, with regards to the uh, new administration and the new chairman of the Industrial Commission, uh, when I might be meeting with the uh, transition team. And no date has been set yet, but um, it sounds like shortly after Thanksgiving uh, will be the time. Uh, we have put together our, our list of uh, concerns and wants and, and needs to, to discuss with that transition team. Um, I uh, certainly am looking forward to serving uh, under new administration. And uh, with regards to that, I, uh, when I took this job, we had a uh, former businessman who was in his very first elected position, Ed Schaefer. And so uh, I've done it before, and uh, I uh, really enjoyed working for that industrial commission. It was an interesting uh, makeup because it was uh, Governor Schaefer, Attorney General Heitkamp, and Ed Commissioner Johnson. And so it was vastly different than, than what we have today. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that visit with the transition team and, uh, and looking forward really to the next legislative session and, and working with this administration. Some of these are really out of bounds, so I'm trying to put them in bounds. Um, what's the best <laughs> case scenario for uh, North Dakota producers to come out of OPEC? Is there a number um, that North Dakota producers would be looking for? Well, I think um, if you look at an ideal scenario, uh, instead of OPEC cutting uh, the, the roughly 700,000 barrels a day uh, that, that they've talked about, that they've just increased their production, 
if they were to cut production, say, by a, a million or a little over a million barrels a day, that would put us solidly above that $50 uh, WPI price, which is uh, a key number in terms of mobilizing frac crews and, and really um, stabilizing production in North Dakota. So I, I think the state and our energy interest, uh, industry would like to see a million barrels a day taken off the market. Uh, they'd like to see 50 to $55 oil, and uh, that would allow them the, the running room to, uh, to frack the wells and to, to stabilize our production above that 900,000 barrels a day. I think you just covered one question with that answer. Um, how active do you think frac crews are expected to be this winter? Uh, we're not expecting any real increase in frac crews through the winter. So uh, right now we're counting 11 frac crews out there. Uh, with winter coming on, that's typically not a great time to frack and, and complete wells. Uh, but with the uh, addition of a dozen rigs next year, uh, and the commitment, or at least the, the discussion on his quarterly call uh, from Mr. Ham, who has the largest inventory of non-completed wells, uh, that he's going to work hard on reducing that inventory next year. I think uh, when load limits come off next spring, uh, we can expect the frac crew uh, count to increase 50 to 100 percent. Anything in the room? Okay, sorry, there's a few questions here that I just think are a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about, so um, we will bring up Justin here. Thank you. <coughs> oh, I missed one. <laughs> Well, that's all right. We're yeah. Not that formal. No, we're not. I missed one, and it's it is it yeah. It's, it's on track. Huh? It is. Okay. It's about um. Will the legislature, governor's office, recalculate its projection for um, oil taxes uh, given our lower for longer price projection? Will that you think come into play here in the next few months? That's a good question, and we actually already built that lower for longer price structure into the most recent revenue forecast. Uh, now, I haven't seen the final results of that forecast, but when we met with folks uh, over at the Rough Rider Room, it was that exact uh, price scenario and activity scenario that we told them to work from. Uh, so you know, they got their work cut out for them to figure out the sales tax angle. But uh, that is the, the price and activity scenario that we built in okay. to the forecast. Thank you. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Justin Crinkstead uh, with North Dakota Pipeline Authority. I'm just going to get right into the slides, uh, similar format to the previous month. On slide two, uh, just taking a look at neighboring uh, states that, that contribute to the transportation um, of oil and gas in the region. Eastern Montana, South Dakota, continuing production slide. Um, zero rigs operated in both of those two regions um, as we speak today. We'll take a look on slide three at the transportation dynamics. Uh, very little shift month to month from uh, August to September. Um, you'll see here on the next slide of how this has been evolving. Uh, so again, taking a look at the blue dotted line um, on slide four, that is the spread between Brent and WTI. That's always a, a good indicator of uh, some of those decisions that are being made uh, for barrels that may not be committed to a pipeline or may not be committed to a rail. And that take a look. At, at, uh, that price spread um, in order to make those transportation decisions. And so um, we're continuing to see that low spread. I think I just checked before we started here, it's still at a dollar. Um, that is not at a level uh, that would encourage folks to uh, continue to use rail. Uh, there's a more uh, more inclined than to take a traditional pipeline out to market either in the Midwest or the, or the Gulf Coast area. We take a look on slide five at Estimated rail um, movements out of the region continuing to be quite low, still hovering right around that 300,000 barrels of oil per day. So again, a couple of the things that were driving that decrease, uh, production decreases, as well as um, that front WTI spread narrowing, again, causing those uh, flexible barrels to move 
uh, towards traditional pipeline markets as opposed to rail. The volumes that are leaving on rail, when we take a look at where they're heading, uh, we're back uh, almost split between the east and the west coast. Um, these are the two primary destinations for oil leaving North Dakota by rail car. If we look at pricing around uh, the U.S., again, east and west coasts have the highest price markets uh, currently for uh, what refineries are paying for that crude oil. And so again, this was for August. Um, the EIA data on the last slide is from August as well. It does cost a little bit more on North Dakota to get oil to the east coast by rail. So it is a little bit uh, of a lower transportation cost by rail to the west coast. And so even when you do see a little bit of a, a price difference between pad five and pad one, uh, transportation costs also play a role um, in where those barrels get marked. And then as we sit today, that spread, as I just mentioned, is just over a dollar. Um, so I'm not expecting any, any major changes in the near term with how barrels are moving out of the region. Truck movements back and forth between the North Dakota and Canada, um, back down to, to some more normalized levels, uh, from some of the spikes that we had seen um, a couple months ago. So nothing, nothing too exciting on, on that front. On the natural gas flaring, a little bit of a shift. Um, if we would take a look at this um, on slide 11, we did see a slight increase in the percentage of uh, gas that's being flared from non-connected wells versus gas being flared from connected wells. Uh, not a major shift, but just a, a very small percentage overall. Um, but as Lynn alluded to, we did see overall gas volumes decrease uh, on the flaring side and just very minor shuffling in where those uh, volumes are coming from out in, out in the play itself. And then taking a look at well connections on the gas gathering side, again, keeping pace. We saw well completions increase in September as well as wells getting connected. So again, industry was able to respond and ramp up the number of new well connections along with that faster pace of well completions in the state. Now on the natural gas liquid standpoint, we're continuing to see a little bit of a decrease in natural gas liquids being produced out of the gas plants in North Dakota. Uh, not a surprise given that natural gas production has been decreasing. So along with that natural gas liquids, um, in turn is also decreasing in the near term. So with that, that includes any formal remarks. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Um, any idea how many rail yards are being shut down at this point? I don't. I don't have a, um, an updated number from the rail carriers as far as how many facilities are still operating. Um, again, the, the rail facilities that are operating uh, most likely are going to be the ones that uh, do have better connectivity, whether it's by pipeline uh, coming in or pipeline connectivity for marketing flexibility on the outbound side. Um, but I would suspect that many of the smaller manifest or the, the non-unit train facilities would probably most likely be the ones to not be operating versus the larger connected unit train facilities. Has there been any talks about any other major pipelines at this point yet? Um, you know, possibly Excel more than the uh, so as far as major projects, so, so in North Dakota we've got several major commodities. We've got the crude oil market, we've got the natural gas, natural gas liquids. And so on the crude oil side, no, um, there's still companies taking a look at um, solutions for natural gas liquids. I think long term for North Dakota, that's going to be one of our, our major transportation issues, um, as well as natural gas um, uh, export out of the region, whether or not we can continue to use the, the current uh, pipelines in place or if additional market outlet options are going to be necessary for natural gas. So there are definitely folks working at new projects on the natural gas side of the world. And I guess I also just had the same question with Lynn about uh, the uh, transition and such. Uh, I guess if you had your take on that from uh, your perspective. So. You know, right now I've not scheduled any uh, meeting with, with the new administration, but when that comes, I'll be excited to sit down and, and talk about it. Transportation world. Um, any, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, the news all sort of profited. Um, do you have the number of actual barrels per month that are being refined at Tesoro and then also in Dickinson? Um, this person is looting that the Dickinson refi refinery is only operating at 70 to 80 percent. I don't have those handy, uh, okay. but there are reports that we can direct you them to. Okay, so. we'll follow up with that. Um, uh, let's 
see. Is there any indication uh, that, uh, I guess, kind of like what, what Nick just asked about um, new crude oil pipelines or possibly the revival of Sandpiper at all? No, at this time, no, no major announcements other than localized, you know, there's still going to be continued effort towards localized gathering, local intrastate crude oil lines or for more efficient movement within the region itself. Any projections um, on how much oil will move, continue to move by rail after Dakota Access is complete? There haven't been any formal um, analysis done, at least from myself or any public sources that I'm aware of. Uh, I think the general consensus is that we'll likely still see some barrels moving by rail. So uh, they're going to continue to look at the markets. And, um, there are places that um, you simply can't get to by pipeline. And so if there's a market advantage to moving crude there, but the likely there will be folks that will continue to use it. But as far as a, a percentage or a, a volume, uh, I don't know that anyone's been able to, to pin that down with any certainty. Um, will there be uh, any impact on shippers if um, and the contracts if Dakota Access is not complete by January 1st? That I don't know. That those contracts are for private and company. Shippers on those pipelines to send other pipelines. I wouldn't have that type of um, insight. Okay. Okay. That looks like much. it is all. Thanks for coming.